Remember what I mentioned that the previously on Avatar segment sometimes use different voice takes? Well, holy shit, here's how Aang sounds in this line originally. Tell me where all it is. And then this is the same line in the recap. Tell me where all it is. It's subtle, but there is a difference. In the second one, it sounds just like Aang and a demonic voice talking, but the one from the actual episode actually sounds like three or four voices talking at the same time. To me, at least. I don't know why it took me so many watch throughs to notice this, but you can actually see Ango flying and land here. Like, it's so obvious, but I just noticed it on my last watch through. There's a bunch of stuff like that for me, actually. Sure. 5,000 year old maps from the Spirit Library. Just splash some water on them. Sorry. Would this be how this works? Wouldn't Katara naturally take some of the ink out of the maps, too? Or, like, a lot of the ink? Toph over here pissed off she can't partake in the map looking activities. It looks like the only passage connecting the south to the north is this sliver of land called the Serpent's Pass. How does Sokka know this is called the Serpent's Pass? He says it as if he didn't already know, and there's, like, no text on this map, so how does he know? The debossing say we go. No more distractions. Hello there, fellow refugees. Perfect distraction timing, classic Avatar. And yes, this is the very family that Zuko was about to rob for food in the episode Zuko Alone. Come on, guys, you think I'm gonna miss something big like that? What's interesting, though, is that they have this other girl with them, who I've heard is actually this guy's sister. I don't know if that's true, but it's interesting that she wasn't around when Zuko was about to mess them up, and that wasn't too, too long ago. And it seems like a really, really unnecessary addition, since she has no lines and does literally nothing the entire episode. What is this thing? Is that a dog with a rat's head? What, the, what is this? I can't believe how many people's lives have been uprooted by the Fire Nation. We're all looking for a better life. Safe behind the walls of Ba Sing Se. Wow, yeah, refugees. Avatar really doesn't pull its punches with how war affects the ones not fighting. We've seen countless villages raised and attacked and destroyed, but because of how those episodes were set up as kind of self-contained stories, the viewer can kind of forget that those people's lives have to carry on. So seeing this and seeing that the war has had lasting ramifications on countless everyday people shows us that this war isn't something to be joked about. People die and get hurt in wars all the time. Everyone knows that. But here we get to see that this show takes its story and world very seriously and knows about the people that get trampled under the constant march of war. It's not just a show that has fighting for fighting's sake and having battles and being cool. There are lasting awful effects to the events that take place. Who would have thought after all these years I'd return to the scene of my greatest military disgrace as a tourist? You think Iroh sniped this nice flower hat from the flower shop before they left last episode? I bet he did. This also really speaks to Iroh's character. Some of the best advice I ever got is that you have to be able to laugh at yourself, so this really endears Iroh to me. Ugh, I'm sick of eating rotten food, sleeping in the dirt. I'm tired of living like this. Aren't we all? My name's Jet. And these are my freedom fighters. Jet introduces himself in the exact same way as he did to the gang back in season one. My name is Jet, and these are my freedom fighters. I told you already, no vegetables on the ferry. One cabbage slug could destroy the entire ecosystem of Ba Sing Se. Security! Ah! <laughs> oh, my cabbages! This is a super weird little cutaway gag, I guess. This guy's cabbages get messed up? I guess that's funny. I don't know, we've never seen him before and we'll never see him again, so this joke just seems really weird. Um, four tickets for the ferry to Bossing Se, please. Passports. Uh, no one told us we had to have passports. There's actually this little low-key line in the last episode that tells us the White Lotus actually got passports made up for Zuko and Iroh. I have the passports for our guests. Which explains how they got on the ferry without any trouble. Don't you know who this is? He's the Avatar. Ah, I see 50 avatars a day, and by the way, not a very impressive costume. Wait, these two are holding hands? Did they come as an Aang duo? I can kind of see how their plan failed. Oof, nice flat JPEG of shelves you put in here, guys. Looks, looks really good. What did Toph just hand to Aang? Seriously, I have no idea. And look at you, sleeveless guy. Been working out? Ah, I'll grab a tree branch and do a few chin touches every now and then. Nothing major. This is funny because Sokka's an idiot, and doing pull-ups wouldn't grow your arms at all. No passports, no tickets! <laughs> you can actually see Aang wipe off the mark that the stamp made really quickly here. You'll get to the city safely. I'll lead you through the Serpent's Pass. I can't believe we gave up our tickets, and now we're going through the Serpent's Pass. Yes, Sokka, that actually is what we just discussed right before the commercial break. Thank you for keeping me updated. What does it say? It says, abandon hope. How could we abandon hope? That's all we have. I don't know. The monks used to say that hope is just a distraction. So maybe we do need to abandon it. What are you talking about? Hope isn't going to get us into Bossing Se, and it's not gonna find Appa. 
We need to focus on what we're doing right now, and that's getting across this pass. I mean, I kind of vibe with this outlook, honestly. Like, the show delivers it as this backward way of thinking, but, I mean, he's right, right? No one's gonna do it for them. Is that really all that unhealthy of a viewpoint? I don't think so. Aang's going through a hard time right now, so this mindset is tied in with that, but I don't think it's all that bad of a way to think, especially in a situation like this. The Fire Nation controls the Western Lake. Rumor has it they're working on something big on the other side and they don't want anyone to find out what it is. So that's gotta be the drill, right? This is just a low-key little line to make it seem like the Fire Nation didn't pull the drill out of absolutely nowhere. I like the little detail that this guy's taking the outer side towards the cliff and keeping his pregnant wife on the inside, away from the drop. Good job. They spotted us! Let's go, let's go! So wait, does the Fire Nation just make a habit of trying to kill everyone they see, civilian or not? Like, no way they could have known it was Aang and company at this distance, and even if they could, there's no way that someone could put an order in this quickly to attack. But still, these guys just fired immediately. Suki, you shouldn't sleep there. Who knows how stable this ledge is? It could give way at any moment. Sokka, I'm fine. Stop worrying. I mean, they're both right. Suki can take care of herself, but it is a pretty stupid idea to sleep, like, right next to a cliff, especially after you just watched this happen. Whoa! They did it! It's not a full moon! Rejoice! By the gods! But seriously, the one time you're not gonna have a full moon, it's where your characters are literally on a body of water called Full Moon Bay. I've always hated back sheaths. They don't make any sense, right? Unless your sword is super short, you just wouldn't be able to put your sword back into them, right? Like, your arm wouldn't be long enough to get the point of your sword back into the top of the sheath. In actually the same shot here we can see Zuko's sword shrink from this length which looked longer than his outstretched arm would be on its own down to this size just so the sheath on his back can actually physically make sense seriously it looks like the swords get dramatically shorter in this one second of animation how was Zuko hooked on here no way that would work right what's going on with you in the desert all you cared about was finding Appa and now it's like you don't care about him at all you saw what I did out there I was so angry about losing Appa, I couldn't control myself. I hated feeling like that. But now you're not letting yourself feel anything. I think this is a really realistic response from Aang. It's very human to see yourself do something you don't like and then dial it way back. Too far back. And then it's still an unhealthy way of doing things, just in the opposite direction. I think this isn't really an emotional state that's explored very often either. So it's cool that they give this kind of feeling an entire episode for Aang to feel out. It's a beautiful moon. Yeah, it really is. This is a cute little conversation, but it's also sad. I like that Sokka can clearly still have feelings for someone, even though he's still hurting over Yue. That's a very real situation that someone can find themselves in. And that probably makes him feel even worse, because he obviously still has strong feelings for Yue, and having feelings for Suki too would feel like he's betraying her. Like, we're in this fantastical world, but the characters deal with very human emotions. That's why you fall in love with these characters. These are real situations that real people deal with. They feel like real people, struggling with grief, and lost like we all do. I can't. I've done some things in my past that I'm not proud of. But that's why I'm going to Ba Sing Se. For a new beginning. A second chance. I like this conversation. It's very earnest and Jet's being very genuine. He's actually going to Ba Sing Se to start a new life. So why do they choose to do this sinister zoom in with the menacing strings along with it? It makes it seem like Jet's lying here. Do they want people to think Jet's lying here? Everyone single file. I'm usually not one to complain about how they choose to solve problems with bending, but this one is one of the more egregious ones. Katara could just as easily make an ice bridge, and even if he didn't want to do that because he was a pregnant lady, Toph could seemingly raise the ground pretty easily. And maybe Toph couldn't have done it all at once and it might have been pretty time consuming or something, but it probably would have made a lot more sense, right? I could have mentioned this at any point, I guess, but did the gang get new sleeping bags since last episode? Because they definitely weren't lugging them through the desert. Okay, looking at the size of this thing and the size of the air pocket that they were all huddled in, how didn't the serpent completely devour at least most of the group on its first drive-by. This may seem convenient that the serpent is right here right now as the gang passes this one submerged section, but I think it makes perfect sense. This one little gap seems like it's the only way that the serpent could pass from the eastern and western sides, so to me it makes sense that he would spend a lot of time there, maybe even make that little area his home. Did Momo really just run closer to it? Oh, never mind, he's back on top shoulder. Oh, never mind again, he's back in front of Sokka. <laughs> If you slow this way down, you can actually see that Katara probably lost a little bit of control here and didn't mean to do that spin. Toph, come on! It's just ice! Actually, I'm 
gonna stay on my little island where I can see. This brings up a really weird thing with Toph's abilities, actually. So the surface she's standing on has to be earthen for her to feel the vibrations through it and see? So, like, she wouldn't be able to see if she was standing on wood or some other surface, despite vibrations traveling across and through those surfaces just as easily? Oh, Sokka, you saved me! Actually, it's me. Oh, well, <laughs> you can go ahead and let me drown now. You know, it sucks. I've said it before, people are gonna get mad if I don't leave their favorite jokes in, but I can't be funny or analytical over top of this. This is just funny. I can't be funnier than this. I guess this is a hint at Toph liking Sokka, but that's never really pursued or talked about at all, so, you know, it's just funny. This is the perfect way to beat this thing, right? Like a really meaty hit that would make it fuck off but not kill it. And it plays to the surrounding of the characters and an interesting new move that Katara and Aang teamed up on. Pretty much genius from an action and storytelling standpoint. I like that Toph doesn't react here because she doesn't see Aang and Katara go flying by. I help Grand Grand deliver lots of babies back home. This isn't the same as delivering an arctic seal! This is a real human thing! I'm Asaka, this is forbidden eldritch science. I'd be freaking out too. I've realized lately that being on your own isn't always the best path. That's a very nice sentiment, Zuko. You did have a pretty rough go in that one episode, so it's satisfying here to see Zuko say this and give Iro some credit for once. See, I'm telling you, little by little, he's opening up. It's not just all at once. Aang, get some rags. Sokka, water. Sokka actually used Katara's pouch to go get water, which makes sense. What's weird is that he ran off without it in the last scene, since we see Katara with it right as she enters the tent. What should we name her? I want our daughter's name to be unique. I want it to mean something. I've been going through a really hard time lately, but you've made me hopeful again. I know what I want to name our baby now. Hope. Ah, come on. No matter how many times I've watched this show, I can never really get around how corny naming their daughter Hope is. It was bordering on corny when Aang had a breakthrough when seeing a newborn baby, but them actually naming her Hope is just jumping the corn shark. Do you think if Ying had her baby a day earlier, she still would have named it Hope? And then when they rocked up on the Serpent's Pass and it was all like, abandoned Hope, she would have freaked out? I would have if I was the dad. I'd have been like, nah man, that's bad mojo, we gotta get the hell out of here. I thought it was trying to be strong. But really, I was just running away from my feelings. Seeing this family together, so full of happiness and love, it's reminded me how I feel about Appa and how I feel about you. It's good that they gave Aang two full episodes to be messed up over Appa. So now it actually feels like a real big loss for Aang. Any less would have felt weird and any more probably would have felt like it was dragging on. Two full episodes for him to reckon with his emotions isn't short though, so him having his breakthrough works, even if the reasoning is a little corny like I said. Sokka, it's been really great to see you again. Whoa, hold on. Why does it sound like you're saying goodbye? I came along because I wanted to make sure you got through the Serpent's Pass safely. But now I need to get back to the other Kyoshi warriors. So Suki has to go back over the Serpent's Pass on her own now, right? So she's gotta go past that underwater section on her own? That's gotta be a pretty stressful swim. Listen, I'm really sorry about last night. We were talking and saying things. I just got carried away and before I knew it, I... Let's go! You gotta love when Sokka gets a W, baby. This is him coming over an emotional hurdle as well, with a little less reasoning behind it, but it still works. He had that night and most of the day to think about it, so I think it's fine. Immediately, the scale of bossing say is set up visually. Not only with this shot of it towering over Aang, but with the earlier shot of it being the entire horizon. We've only heard about the city at this point, usually in reverence, so the wall surrounding it being so strikingly large only enforces the idea of its importance. <laughs> Sorry, Momo. Appa's gonna have to wait. And this line really drives home the fact that Aang has emotionally come to terms with the fact that he's not gonna find Appa right away, which softens the blow of the next episode not having anything to do with finding Appa at all. Really smart writing all the way around. This episode's really good. It's so emotionally driven. Pretty much the entire runtime is the cast dealing with things they've done or failed to do or had happen to them. If you remove the serpent scene, this entire episode is basically just talking. I don't think the episode's any weaker for it though. They're all really strong conversations about the various internal struggles that our characters are 
having, and none of them fall flat. Sokka, Aang, Iroh, and Zuko even get introspective moments, and they all land well. The episode itself is actually built around these emotional scenes, much more than any action or comedy. The action scene with the serpent isn't even that close to the finale moment. What we get instead is an emotional finale, with Aang having his breakthrough. Like I said, these characters don't feel like cartoon characters. They feel like real people, who have to deal with things just like we do. And that's part of what makes this show so special, and this episode really highlights that kind of stuff. Patron shoutouts! If you want to be two full episodes ahead of the YouTube releases for overanalyzing Avatar, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Towering shoutouts go to my top patrons, Fritz Sullivan, who reached enlightenment in four different religions, a world record. Keegan Scott, who was immune to conventional weapons. Skylos, the one true heir to the Neptunian throne. And Zoopy, who can light people who aren't named Terrence on fire with his mind. So if your name's not Terrence, you know, watch out for that guy. Other huge shoutouts go to my other top patrons, Be My Valentine, Code Cannot, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Eleanor Rose, Garmer, Glintlock, Nicholas Abbott, Praker Gas, The Most Super of Snippers, and Tiago Nascimento. Next up is the drill. You can tell because of the giant drill in the episode.